Welcome everyone to our Redbud Phenology Project kickoff webinar. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so everyone here is muted. As you will see, um, we are going to have the opportunity for some questions at the end, but we would ask you to stay muted. Um, we are recording this webinar, and so uh, we will be sharing the recording at the um, end after the presentation with everyone who registered. We'll also have the recording and the slides available on our Redbud Phenology Project website. So my name is Erin Postumus. I am the Outreach Coordinator at the USA National Phenology Network based at the University of Arizona. I'm located here in Tucson. And today I am joined by Dr. Jorge Santiago Bly. He is a research associate at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, as well as a adjunct lecturer at Penn State York. I'm also joined by Teresa Crimmins, who is our director of the USA National Phenology Network. So we are very glad that you're all here with us today to learn all about red buds and how you can participate in doing phenology monitoring this coming spring and throughout the year. So I will go ahead and get started with the slideshow here. So um, just to give you an overview of what we're gonna be talking about today, we're gonna first hear from Dr. Santiago Bly about the research that's behind this campaign, why we care about red buds and the questions that we're hoping to answer. Then we'll go into what we learned from our pilot project last year. And then I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the USA National Phenology Network and our Nature's Notebook program. Then we will talk about how you can get started with observations as part of our red bud campaign. We'll go over lots of training materials and resources available to you, and then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. So feel free to put any questions you have in the chat as we go along, and we will make sure to get to those at the end. Um, I also welcome you to put in the chat where you're calling in from and anything else you wanna share. I know there's been some crazy weather across the country recently, so real, feel free to share whatever you like about that. Uh, we have pretty sunny weather here in Tucson right now, so um, it's a little chilly, but we're, we're feeling pretty good about our weather. All right, and so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Santiago. Bye. Hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or uh, good evening, wherever you may be located at. Um, we began this uh, project on... Um, Eastern North America red bot uh, around four years ago uh, when undergraduates at Penn State York and I began uh, studying different aspects of the biology of uh, a red bot. Um, on year 2020, off of a sudden, uh, I noticed that uh, the abundant uh, seed pods as shown on, on the left panel that normally appear on a, a red bot later in the season, let's say from, uh, from late uh, summer onwards, were not there. And I asked myself the question, why? How, in other words, the, okay, the trees in year 2020 uh, were Early, if at all, uh, producing any seed pods like on the panel to the right. So that, if I may have the, uh, uh, the next slide. Um, or okay, so uh, made us wonder uh, what was what had caused that, and uh, in collaboration with Dr. Uh, Teresa Crimmins, uh, we overlaid a map of the uh, late uh, spring uh, frost on the year 2020. And uh, in this map, the darker pink colors represent a, a relatively late, either three, four, five, or even more weeks later as compared to uh, year 2019. That means that the frost was much later. The points were harvested, were garnered with the help of numerous citizen scientists uh, during year 2020 from all over the United States. And then when we overlaid, overlaid the map on the points, 
And I should explain that the red points means no, no uh, seed pods at all. And yellow means almost, almost no seed pods, but not zero. We found a good uh, coincidence between the fact that there was a late uh, a spring frost and uh, the fact that many of the trees were not actually producing uh, seed pods. And that immediately uh, uh, re reinforced in us, if I may have the next slide, please, the idea that there is a, a strong effect of the climate. And in the case of 2020 of the specific weather phenomena. So well before 2020, when actually when we began this uh, project four or so uh, uh, years ago, we have we had been we have been asking the question, well, does the flowering and fruiting timing is is it changing as the planet warms up? And that is indicated by the blue line that is going down. It's pretty much as I like to explain to uh, students in my classes, like baking a cake. Grandma would slap my hand if, as, a, as a little boy if I would want to open the oven to see how is the cake going. So she didn't like that. Uh, but I always would tell uh, 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 grandma, oh, grandma, please crank the Oven so that the cake is ready faster, right? So the same with the flowers and, uh, uh, and the fruits are their biology. Is the flowering happening earlier? Is the fruiting happening earlier? In other words, earlier in the year. So on this particular graph, we have 1820s. Why? None of us were there, but others were, and they perpetuated that fact by creating herbarium sheets. So the way we get the very old data is by going to uh, the databases of numerous um, uh, you know, herbaria in the United States. So the earliest uh, datum we have is from the 1820s, all the way to the present. And if I may have uh, uh, the next slide. Thank you. Uh, all of this has been possible, not only the observations we made about 2020, but all of this harvesting of data uh, could not be done by any one of us, either Erin alone or Teresa alone or me alone, or even the three of us. This is a monumental task that has required us contacting citizen uh, uh, scientists, be them undergraduates at Penn State York or elsewhere, or at, or at the Smithsonian Institution. So I want to say wholeheartedly, thank you for considering helping us. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them, uh, um, uh, maybe towards the end, right? Yeah, okay, I have, I have nothing else to say, thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for that overview. It's it's great to learn about um, the importance of red buds and how things are changing and, and why it's so critical that we have people collecting data all across the country. So thank you so much. Uh, so I wanted to get into a little bit more about the red bud phenology. So as you all probably are aware, red bud is a iconic tree that blooms early in the year. Um, it has beautiful pink buds on it and flowers, so it's very attractive and it's a great ornamental tree. People love to plant it um, and people love to follow and, and see when these plants flower. Um, the redwood natural range is across much of the eastern part of the country, although uh, people have planted it in other places as well. It is a a, a smaller tree or a large shrub um, up to about 20 feet usually. So it often exists as an understory plant. So this is kind of a, an image that you'll see often in the early or late winter, early spring where red buds are blooming and there's not much else going on in the forest. So you can see behind in the photo, a lot of the larger deciduous trees um, don't have leaves yet. So the red buds are um, taking advantage of that time when the deciduous trees don't have leaves 
to have their flowers um, and then put out their leaves and take advantage of that sunlight in the understory. Uh, typically, red buds first put on their flower buds, and then as the flowers start to open, then their leaf buds start to emerge as well. So that's kind of the typical progression that we see. Uh, and then they will have their seed pods that come in in the springtime, um, and those often will persist through the year into the fall and sometimes the winter as well. So looking back at what we learned from some observations last year, this is a map that shows different observation sites across the country that reported on eastern redbud, and they were in particular reporting on open flowers of these trees. And so the color of the icons that you see on the map corresponds to that legend at the bottom. So you can see that in southern states, we have a pretty early open flower, uh, where some of them are maybe even in January or February, and then up in the northern parts of the country, um, getting more into the later months in the springtime. So that's typically when we will see these uh, flowers for these spe this species. This is a curve that shows kind of the peak in the flowering and open flowers for this species. Uh, we've broken this out by flowers, which indicates whether there are any flowers or flower beds at all, and then open flowers. So you can see that red line um, shows that while there were a few reports that were early, even in January, the majority of the trees started having their flower buds about the end of February, um, increasing up to a peak in about mid-March. And then the open flower started uh, in late February and then had a peak, um, this is over the average of the whole country um, at the end of April. We can also look at the, the fruits or the seed pods for this species. So the fruits, um, again, this is any fruits, whether or not they're ripe, that's the green line starting in uh, late March and then peaking in about late May, early June. And then the ripe fruits um, starting in late May and then really peaking in more in the fall when those fruits were ripe. Um, and again, that's the average across the entire country from last year. So the questions that we're interested in trying to answer, um, as Dr. Santiago Blay has told us about, um, we're really interested in all, uh, what is the timing of red bud flowering um, and also fruiting. So when, when are these things happening? Um, and does this vary across the range of this species? Is it different in different locations? Is it different at different elevations? Um, also, is there a cycle? Are there some years where there are a lot of fruits or seed pods on these trees? Um, and is this a cycle in some way? Does it occur every year, every couple years? Um, the observations that you collect will help us answer that. Um, and then also, as uh, Dr. Santiago Bly was talking about, has the timing advanced? Um, are we seeing an impact of climate change and warming temperatures advancing the phenology of this species? So the objectives um, are for this Red Bud Phenology Project, uh, which is a Nature's Notebook campaign. Um, and Nature's Notebook is our data collection program at the USA National Phenology Network. So just to give you kind of a background about the USA NPN and what we're all about. Um, so we were established back in 2007 um, as a way to collect, store, and share phenology data and information all across the country. Um, at that point, there wasn't a standardized way to collect phenology data. So we were established as the way to kind of standardize that, give everyone a, a set of shared protocols that were scientifically rigorous and um, easy for anyone to use. And so we can collect information. Um, everyone can collect information all across the country on a wide variety of plants and animals. This is just an overview of kind of what the NPN is all about. So we're hoping that the information that we're providing is going to help inform decisions that people like natural resource managers are making. So helping people at the Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Forest Service have the information that they need to make decisions on the ground. So knowing about invasive species and habitat for wildlife of interest and things like that. We also want to advance science. So we wanna advance the field of phenology and we're trying to provide this large data resource to give researchers information they need to answer questions like Dr. Santiago Blay is trying to answer. We also try to communicate and connect about phenology. So just trying to share information about 
what is the current research on phonology and make sure that it's in a format that's accessible to everyone. Uh, we also connect with lots of different groups. We have several different communities of practice where we're trying to connect people and make sure that they have the resources that they need. And then we also strive to create an equitable and inclusive network. So we're trying to make sure that the information we're providing is accessible and useful for all audiences across the country. And phonology has applications for so many different fields. Uh, there are obvious things like ecology, so knowing about the interaction between plants and their pollinators. Um, also agriculture, knowing when to plant things and when to harvest crops. It also has uh, applications for things like wildfire season, so knowing when things green up, how much fuel is available, when things are senescing or drying out. Um, that can give a lot of information about when to expect wildfire season. Uh, also seasonal allergies, so knowing when plants are flowering and releasing their pollen can give us cues about when allergy season is starting, um, both when it starts, how severe it will be, and how long it will be. And then we can also use phenology to address invasive species and pest management. So knowing about when plants are green enough to spray with herbicide, knowing about when uh, different insects are emerging to know when to spray trees to treat them. Um, all of these are examples of how phenology can be used. Phenology is also a great way to understand climate change impacts and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change all the way back in 2007 stated that phenology is a really simple, useful indicator to see how climate change is impacting the environment and something that really everyone can observe. We also can use phenology to understand the importance of collecting long-term records and see changes over time. So I really like this example of data that was first collected by Aldo Leopold in Wisconsin and then continued on by his daughter, Nina Leopold Bradley. And this data set has continued and researchers in modern times have collected data in the same areas. And we can really use that to know what changes have occurred over that long-term period. Um, and so in one example, some researchers were able to look at these data and see that the arrival of some birds like sandhill cranes and geese has really shifted weeks earlier than it was during Aldo Leopold's time. So because we have those records and all that information about the phenology written down, we can understand those changes that are happening. So I would love to know whether you keep track of phenology data where you are, um, and there might be different ways that you do this. So I'm gonna launch our first poll here, um, just to ask about what is your experience with phenology? Perhaps some of you are Nature's Notebook Observers already. Uh, maybe you've collected data as part of a different program. Uh, maybe you keep your own records of phenology or you just pay attention to the changes that you see without necessarily recording them. Or maybe we haven't quite convinced you yet, but hopefully we will by the end of this webinar. All right, so people are still voting. I'll give it another couple seconds. Okay, a couple more still coming in. Okay, I think we've got almost everyone. So it looks like the majority pay attention to seasonal changes, but don't keep records. Although we do have, it looks like at least 15 people that are already Nature's Notebook observers. And then a couple of people that have collected phenology data for different programs, uh, several that keep track of their own records and then some that don't yet track phenology. So most of you pay attention to seasonal changes, which is great. So I think you will all make wonderful phenology observers. So to give you a little bit more information about our Nature's Notebook program, Nature's Notebook is the primary way that we have data that come into the USANPN and our National Phenology Database. So this map shows all of the different sites that have been um, recorded by folks across the country where people are recording phenology data on plants or animals. Um, and we have many, many sites, as you can see, over 17,000 sites across the country. And then the circles on there represent how much data have been submitted. 
So you can see that there are certain parts of the country where we have a lot of data coming in, like in the Northeast, uh, along the West Coast, and in some of the urban areas across the country. And then we also have some gaps in data as well. So we're always looking for folks that can help us fill in some of those data gaps. Um, and, and then of course, we always welcome any observations that you can submit anywhere in the country. So one of the things we do to encourage people to collect phenology data is a suite of Nature's Notebook campaigns. So we have, I think, nine campaigns um, that we're running this year uh, through Nature's Notebook. And these are campaigns that are inspired by researchers or natural resource managers um, or agencies like the Fish and Wildlife Service that have a need for phenology data. And so we launch a campaign to try to help them get the data that they need to answer the questions that they have. So you can see on the map here, um, this is our list from last year. We'll be adding on our red bud to this this year, as well as another oak campaign. Um, but you can see kind of based on where you're located, all the campaigns that might be available to you. Um, but these are often range from one to many species um, that are involved. And um, basically when you sign up for a campaign, you are saying that you're going to help us collect data on a particular species or a group of species. And by signing up for the campaign, we will send you regular updates throughout the season about um, why the campaign is important, uh, tips and resources to help you make observations, and then results of what you and others that are part of the campaign are reporting throughout the year. Um, and we like to give you lots of updates about how your data are used, so you can make sure that you understand where your data are going and what the researchers are finding with your data. We also have a variety of different ways that you can visualize your own data as well as data from others across the country. So this is our uh, visualization tool that we have. Um, I think Teresa will share a link to that in the chat. Um, but I welcome you to go on there and start to explore some of the data. You can look at what we have for red buds. You can look at other species that you might be interested in. It's just a great way to be able to see what people are recording um, in real time. You can see data that have been submitted up to yesterday. We also, um, we take a lot of pride in that our data are very useful and used by uh, many different researchers. So this is just a few examples of how some of the nature's notebook data have been used, used over the past few years. Uh, we do regular summaries of these research publications and post them on our website. So there's a link on there to a page where you can see all of the different, we call them publication summaries that we've done. Um, so you're welcome to go on there and learn about how some of the data have been used, um, what researchers are finding, um, and we're constantly updating that page. So you can check back frequently there. So let's move into how to get started with the Redbud Phenology Project. So um, I'm gonna run through these different steps here. We're gonna talk about how you can create a Nature's Notebook account, um, how you add a site, which is the place where you're doing your observations, how you add a Redbud, record data on your Redbud, and then how to sign up for our campaign emails. So to get started, if you're not yet a Nature's Notebook observer, uh, the first thing you'll want to do is go to the Nature's Notebook website and look on the Observe menu for that link to become an observer. Once you get there, you'll be taken to this page here, and there are really two options of ways that you can sign up. So we have a mobile app um, that works on iPhone and Android. Um, this is an app that works offline, so if you're in a place where you don't have reliable service, you can still use the app and upload your observations. And then uh, once you get back into a Wi-Fi signal or a good um, cellular signal, you can have your data uploaded into the database. Um, or you can sign up on the website. And then if you want to use paper data sheets, we have that option available too, and you can then enter them on the website. So those are the, the two main ways of getting started. I'm going to go through the um, signing up on the website here. So if you decide to uh, sign up online, you'll be taken to this form and you'll fill in a username, email address, and password. You can skip over this partner group section. I'll talk a little bit about our partners at the end, um, but you don't need to sign up for any partners as part of the campaign. Um, then you agree to the terms of use. 
uh, answer the, the validation question and then click the create new account button. Then you'll be walked through a couple different steps to get things started. So you'll first be asked to choose your site. And so a site is the place where you're going to be making your observations regularly. And so we really hope that the site will be something that is convenient to you. So these are just a few things to think about. We want you to make sure that your site is convenient. Um, so it's somewhere close by where you can get to. It could be your backyard. Um, it could be a park nearby or a trail nearby, um, someplace where you can get to um, regularly. It also should be representative. So we want it to be kind of um, typical of the place where you're living. So if that's in an urban area, then it can be your backyard and that's fine. It's you know typical of the surrounding area. Uh, if you live in more of a rural area, try to pick a site that's representative of that kind of um, habitat as well. Uh, we also ask that you pick something that's a uniform habitat. So this graphic here kind of shows how you might select different sites. If you're in an area that's very diverse, um, you wouldn't want to have one site encompass all of these different kind of ecosystem types. Your site is really meant to represent a consistent representative area. So you might have a site that is these deciduous trees, another site that's more of the evergreen trees, and maybe another site that's more of an open, more meadow kind of area. And then as far as appropriate size, um, your site can be one tree if you just want to observe a single redbud. Um, it could be your whole backyard. It could be an entire park if that seems like it's a consistent habitat um, and you're able to kind of do whatever observations you're hoping to do in that area. Uh, we're not going to really talk about animal observations today, but the appropriate size for uh, a site that includes animal observations should really include a site that you can survey completely so you're able to count all of the animals that are in that site. But if we're just talking about plants, it's really encompassing the area that includes any number of individuals that you're tracking. So in order to create your site, you can either type in an address here. This is a just a Google map, um, or you can click on the map and move a pin around to find your exact site. So once you create your site, you'll be asked about selecting a plant. And so um, you can start typing in, um, you don't have to put the scientific, scientific name here, but you can start typing in Redbud and it'll come up with um, the scientific name. And you can select that and then it'll automatically assign it a nickname. And then you can uh, proceed to the next step. And so here we have just a couple of resources that are available. I'm gonna talk more about our certification course a little bit later. Um, but these are just a couple of quick links here to help you get started. Um, there's also a, a link um, about printing the paper data sheets as well. And then you can also find more of the links to the uh, mobile apps here too, if you want to do both things online and on the mobile app. So once you go to your observation deck, um, you will get to this screen here. And so the observation deck is really the hub where if you're working on the website, you're gonna be doing all of your, um, your observations, um, entering them online, printing any paper data sheets and things like that. Um, so just to kind of run through all the things that are on this page, up at the top here, we have a learning section. So this is the link where you can get into your um, ob ob or observer certification course. And so this has a number of different modules to help you kind of learn how to use the system. There's a basic how to observe module. Um, there's a whole module on how to use the app. There's also um, more details about the phenophases, which are the life cycle stages that we ask you to observe, um, and then a practice module as well. And we're actively right now working on filling in those other modules as well. So some of the more advanced training. And so you can get to that learning dashboard here. You can also get into your account details here on the right. So if you need to update your password or change your email, um, add in any other details, um, you can do that here. And then you can also sign up for weekly reminders to observe, which are just emails that come every Wednesday that give you a prompt to um, remember to make observations on your, your plants or animals. And then down at the bottom here, this is really the main part of where you will go to add any sites, um, add any plants that you want to print off your data sheets and then enter your data. So once you add a site, so if you went through those steps that I just showed, uh, you created a home site, you added a red bud, you'll see those right here. Um, if you wanted to add another red bud, you can go to this add or edit plants and add on another one here. 
Um, you could also add a separate site if you wanted to divide up. Maybe you're in a, a park that has a lot of different habitats, and so you want to add in different sites. You can um, add other sites here. And then uh, if you need to print the data sheets, you can do that from the links here. Uh, I mentioned entering the observation data. If you click here and then you get taken to another screen that lets you put in the data. And then you can also download your own data. And then this visualize my data will take you into our visualization tool with a filter preset so you can look at your data right in the tool. So that's kind of a general overview of the observation deck. So if you are already a Nature's Notebook observer and you'd like to participate in this campaign, uh, you can just add on another um, plant to your species list here by going to this add or edit plants and then you can add a red bud. Uh, if you wanna add it at a different site, you just follow this link here to add a new site and then you can add a red bud to that site. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, you don't need to you know, join any campaign in here. It's just adding a red bud and that will um, count your data towards this campaign. So as far as recording data, uh, for each of the species that we have on the Nature's Notebook list, we have a data sheet or a protocol. And so this is the one for the Eastern Redbud. So you'll see there is a series of questions that are all, do you see, and then the name of a life cycle event or what we call a phenophase. So for each of these questions, we're asking you, um, do you see this thing with a yes or no response? We also have this question mark in case you're not sure, you can still circle something on the data sheet. You can always go back and edit your observations later. So let's say you're not sure if you're seeing a flower bud, you could put a question mark and then say you go back the next week and you know it definitely was, you can always change that to a yes later. Um, and then we also have this little line next to the question mark. And that's for an additional question about the intensity or the degree that you see that occurring. Um, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. So as part of this campaign, we're really focused on the flowering and the fruiting phenophases. So that's what um, these last uh, six, or no, five phenophases are here. Um, questions about um, the flowers, open flowers, fruits, ripe fruits, and then recent fruit or seed drop. And so for each of the questions we have on the data sheet, we have what we call a phenophase definition. And so that's what this table is here on the right. Um, you can find this on our Redbud landing page. Um, so Teresa can put that link in the chat as well. Um, and so for each of these questions, we're giving you pretty detailed information about what you're looking for. So we don't want you to guess at what a flower bud is or what a seed pod is and when it's ripe. Uh, we're trying to give you a lot of details to help you answer those questions. So let's just go through these. So for the flowers or flower buds, um, we're talking about fresh, open, or unopened flowers. So this can be a bud or an open flower um, that you see on the plant. So this second part is pretty important. So this is a species that can have what we call winter buds. So this means that it might put on little buds um, at the end of the year, even in the winter, and then they'll, it'll hold on to these dormant buds all winter long, kind of in waiting period for warming temperatures so that it knows when to start um, opening the buds. And so when you see those tiny winter buds that are very closed and, and tight, um, don't include those as flowers or flower buds until you see them start to swell. And so if you are tracking your plant um, and going about once a week or so, you know, as things start to warm up, you will see that change happening. Um, and it might take a little while. If you're unsure, you're always welcome to put that question mark. But if you regularly start to look at your plant, you'll see those small changes start to happen. Um, and you'll notice when those buds start to swell and grow. So once they start swelling um, and starting to slightly open, you can count it as the flowers or flower buds. And then once the flowers open up and you can actually see the reproductive parts on the flower, that's when you can count them as open flowers. And um, we'll go over this as well again, but. Uh, once you report open flowers, you should still report a yes for the flowers or flower buds. This is kind of an overlapping category. So any flowers or flower buds still report yes, but then once they open, you say open flowers as well. And so once the flowers have started to dry up and they're wilted, um, you can report a no again for that question. 
As for the fruits, um, we're asking you again about any fruits that you see, whether or not they're ripe. Um, and we give you some more information specifically for the red bud. And we tell you that the fruit is a pod that changes from green to purplish to dark brown and over time splits to expose the seeds. Um, and then don't include the empty pods. So as soon as you start to see these pods, um, regardless of the color, you can report fruits. And then for ripe fruits, um, it says here, it's considered ripe when it has turned dark brown. So once the fruit has turned dark brown, you would start to say a yes for ripe fruits and then continue to report a yes as well for the, the fruits. Um, this is a species that can hang on to its empty pods as well. So um, if you see that um, the, the pods have emptied and dropped their seeds, you can start to report a no for that question, um, even if the empty pods are hanging on the tree. But keep reporting fruits until you see those pods have released their seeds. And this last phenophase question um, is really meant if, I don't think it really applies too much for this species because it does hold on to its pods for a long time. But we have this on here in case, let's say you missed doing visits for a month and the last time you went to make a visit, um, you saw that there were some fruits, but they weren't ripe. And then you came back and all the empty pods are there. There's no uh, seeds left on the tree. And so you kind of missed out on entering that ripe fruits question. Um, so this allows you to say, oh, things have dropped. I can see there are some seeds on the ground, um, but I missed that ripe fruits question. So that would be when you would answer that last one is a yes. So this uh, graphic here kind of explains further that overlap that we have in the different questions. So this would be a typical year. So in the springtime, um, maybe in the winter for the red bud, you would start saying a yes for flowers or flower buds. And then once the flowers open, you would start reporting a yes for open flowers, but continue to say yes for flowers or flower buds. And then once the fruit started, you would say yes for fruits until you saw them turn ripe. And then you would say yes for ripe fruits as well as fruits. And then there might be a period where you're also saying recent fruit or seed drop. So that's kind of the progression that you might see in a typical year. So when you enter your observations, I mentioned you can do either data sheets that you print out or you can do everything on the app. Um, and so these are very similar looking. Um, they all have the same questions. So this would be a typical data sheet for Redbud where you would have um, you can just answer these questions if you like, or you're also willing, if you're willing to um, enter the other questions for leaf, you can do that as well if you want to. But you would report on um, these questions here on each visit, uh, reporting your yes or no. And then you would take your data sheet and then enter it onto the website um, using that link at the bottom of your observation deck to enter data. If you want to use the mobile app, you'll see all of the same questions here where you can report yes, no, or question mark. Um, and then you can get those phenophase definitions with this little I button here. So if you needed a review on what we're asking for, you can just tap that and get the information. And then once you save the data, it automatically goes into the database and you don't have to do anything else after that. Uh, so this is just a note about the um, frequency of how often you should monitor. Um, so we recommend monitoring at least once a week if you can when things are changing. We realize that that might be too much for a lot of people and that's totally fine. We want any observations that you can give us are very helpful. Um, but it, if you are able to kind of ramp up and do more frequent observations, the most useful time is when things are changing. So if you have a tree and you're seeing that things are starting to swell, you know, the buds are starting to get bigger, um, you might want to start doing once a week observations then. And then once things are really ready to open, um, if you do more than once a week during that time, you can really decrease that um, time where we, uh, between your last no observation and your first yes. So that's kind of the, uh, helps us determine the onset of when things actually started happening. So if you were able to capture that open flowers within three days instead of within six days, um, that's a more reliable estimate of when that thing first started happening. And it helps with the research when they're trying to compare things like when the flowers first opened to what the temperature was. Um, it's a lot more useful if we have a smaller window there than if there's a larger window. Um, and then after the open flowers have you first reported that, you could start doing less frequent observations after that. So here is a, an example of a phenology calendar, of what it might look like after doing a year of data collection. This one's for fruits and ripe fruits. 
So each of these lines represent uh, a no observation in gray. So this person was going out starting in March and they were observing really frequently throughout the year. Um, and then they first reported the, the fruits about here in mid-May. They continued to see fruits all the way through the fall. And then they saw their no observation here at the end. So we know that the period of fruiting was during this, this time here. And then the bright fruits as well. They, they didn't see bright fruits until a couple months after the seed pods, seed pods first appeared. Um, and then the end of ripe fruits was here in December. So I mentioned that we have um, our phenophase definition. So this is what it looks like when you print out your paper data sheet. Um, this is the information that accompanies the questions. Um, and in addition to answering yes or no, we also have a question about um, the intensity or the degree to which that phenophase was occurring. And so that's what is um, circled here um, in the italics. So in addition to whether or not you see flowers or flower buds, how many flowers or flower buds are present? Um, these are optional questions. So if you don't feel comfortable answering these questions, you could just answer the yes or no questions. Um, you could really, you know, if you're not comfortable with um, even answering the fruit questions, you can always just do a portion of the data sheet. Um, if you do want to answer the intensity questions, uh, we do have bins provided. So those are groups of numbers to help you make an estimate um, and they're exponentially increasing. So it starts out with um, less than three, three to 10, and then all the way up to more than 10,000 to help you uh, quantify what's going on um, for larger trees. Uh, so that's similar for both the flowers or flower buds and the fruits where we're asking you about how many you see and then asking you to put it in a bin of numbers. For the open flowers and the ripe fruits, we're asking you about what percentage of all of the flowers you see are open. And so these are groups of percentages that allow you to pinpoint um, when where, where your estimate falls in those bins. So what you might see after the course of a growing season where you're, you're reporting yes for open flowers, you could see an increasing um, percentage bin across the year. And then this helps us identify the peak in when um, open flowers were at their greatest. And so the final step in um, joining the campaign is to sign up for messages. And then these are, these are just um, approximately monthly messages that we send out to um, allow you to get all of the resources and the tips and all of the results about what we're finding with your data. So Teresa will put that link in as well um, in the chat. So please sign up if you're interested and we will be sending out our first message in the next couple of weeks. So I have just a couple um, little quizzes here to help test your skills at making observations. Um, so we, um, have here a photograph and so I'm going to have you um, look at the photograph here and also you can use this um, list of the phenophase definitions um, that we have here on the right and I'm going to launch a poll and so you can answer um, this is going to be a multiple choice for the different phenophases that we have um, so this is similar to the data sheets in that we have the um, do you see question uh, with flowers or flower buds, open flowers, fruits, and ripe fruits. So you can answer more than one if you like, but try to answer and see what you would report for a, a yes for this photograph example. I'll we'll give it a few more seconds. Looks like over half of people have reported. Got some more coming in. And remember, if you're unsure, just read the definition carefully because um, it gives you all the information that you need to answer the question. All right, we've got almost all of them now. So I'm gonna close this out and share the results. So by far the majority of you said, um, I see flowers or flower buds, but nothing else. Um, a couple people said open flowers and there were, it was one person that said fruits as well. Um, so, if you look at the definition for open flowers, remember that we only consider them to be open when the reproductive parts are visible. And as far as I could see from this, I know it's just a one little picture of a small part of this tree, but these are all closed flowers here. I don't see any reproductive parts. 
so the correct answer here would be uh, just the flowers or flower beds, but nothing else. And we have one more here um, that is another photograph to look at. And I will launch another poll here. Um, so again, you have the phenophase definitions to help you. Um, and you can answer uh, for as many of these as you like. And remember that the phenophase definitions have that important information that tells you uh, when you should consider the fruit to be ripe. Okay, we've got almost everyone has voted. Okay, so we have um, most people answered ripe fruits for sure. And some people also answered fruits. Um, if you remember about our overlapping phenophases, anytime that you say ripe fruits, you should also report fruits. Um, and likewise, anytime you say open flowers, you should also say flowers or flower buds. So the correct answer we're looking for here would be um, the both of these two here. You see ripe fruits, you know they're ripe because they're dark brown, like it says in the definition. Um, and because you're saying ripe fruits, you should also say fruits. So both of the last two would be correct. I don't see any flowers on here. It's possible that you would have them overlapping at some point, but in this photograph, we're not seeing flowers. So the last two would be correct. All right, thank you for participating in that. I'm not sure what happened with our screen here with all the annotations. I don't know if we can get those up, but um, there is an annotate menu. I don't know, Teresa, if you can see if there's something you can get to there, but it's fine if not. Um, okay, so a couple things to remember about red buds, just things to leave you with. Um, so, Keep in mind that redbud trees may not flower until they're several years old. So if you have a very new plant that you've gotten at a nursery that's just been planted, um, you may not see flowers for a couple of years. So you might not wanna select that plant until it's a little bit more mature. Also, I mentioned that um, this species can have winter buds. So don't count those as a yes for flowers or flower buds until you start to see those swelling. Um, and so if you are tracking your plant um, once a week or every other week or so, um, then you should be able to see that change happening. And then you, when you see them swelling, you can report a yes. When you're reporting on open flowers, make sure you look for those reproductive parts. Um, so this photograph shows the little the stamens and pistils and things that you would look for here to know that the flowers are open. Also, um, keep in mind that the red buds can hold on to those empty seed pods. So um, once you see that the seed pods are open and have released the seeds, um, then you should stop reporting that as a yes. If you do decide to report on the leaf phenophases, um, this red bud is similar to several of our other deciduous trees that sometimes have a reddish looking small leaf that first appears. Um, but don't consider this to be our colored leaves. Um, this is something that happens sometimes because it, you know, it looks colored, but we're really looking for that more typical um, summer, late fall, autumn color. Um, so don't report this, wait until the plant has leafed out, has mature leaves and then changes in leaf color. Um, and if you do have more than one red bud available, um, I encourage you to collect, uh, start uh, doing data collection on more than one tree, this can really help with kind of um, covering all the variation that there might be in different individuals. Um, you're always welcome to start with just one tree, but if you're, you know, you've observed your one tree for a while and you're feeling comfortable um, and you have the other trees available, um, we really like when people have more than one tree of the same species at a site to kind of cover all of that variation. So the training resources we have available, I've already talked about these, but the, the data sheets that you print out come with these phenophase definitions, um, as well as those intensity questions. All this information is also on the app. Uh, we also have a botany primer that I welcome you to check out. Um, this is a, 
a lot of different photographs and great detail on botany. So if you want more information to help you do your observations, um, you can access the PDF here um, and you can also order a printed version. And another resource is our observer certification course. So this is located from the top of your observation deck. Um, you can click on any of these module links or this learning dashboard, um, and then you can take the course. Um, you can take, take it and, and pause midway. You don't have to do it all at once. It'll save your progress. Um, and you can go through the different modules and um, get lots of tips on doing observations here. And then lastly, I wanted to mention that we do have local phenology programs, and these are where groups of people come together and do observations on the same individual plants or animals at a site um, and kind of share the, the task of doing observations. So if you want more information about that, feel free to reach out. Uh, we have lots of resources available. We have a certification course for local phenology leaders, people that lead these groups. We have lots of program planning resources and, and other resources. So feel free to reach out if you want more detail about that. And so lastly, our little recap here. Um, if you wanna get started with the campaign, first create a Nature's Notebook account if you don't have one already, add a site, um, and then uh, one or more individual redbud trees. You'll go back to these same trees over time. Uh, record your observations um, uh, at least once a week if you can during the time when things are changing rapidly. Um, take advantage of the training materials that we have, um, the data sheets and the definitions and the observer certification course, and then make sure you sign up for the campaign messages so that you can get all of the results in your inbox. So that is all I have. Um, we are happy to answer questions now. If there are questions in the chat, I think we still have a few minutes. Um, if we don't get to any questions, we can always um, answer those in the text form and then send out the responses to to the email list. Erin, we've got a couple questions over the webinar, the course of the webinar that I'd like to have you answer to if you're comfortable doing so. Um, the first one is about the protocol. Um, someone asked if they are observing this spring and the tree still has some ripe fruits that are hanging on from last year. How should they handle that? Yeah, so you can report those as long as they're not empty seed pods. Um, you can report those as ripe fruits as well. And fruits. Thanks, Erin. <laughs> also, um, someone asked if they knew the cultivar of their red bud. First off, we are interested in cultivars and observations from cultivars. And if they know the cultivar information, we recommend that they indicate that in the comments field for the plant when they're registering the plant. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So there's that um, on your observation deck, the place where you add or edit plants. There are a couple fields there that ask about other details about your plant. You know, is it watered? Is it fertilized? Is it under a shade? So you can answer all those and then there's a text field and you can put in there the cultivar in the comments field. Uh, also, um, there was a question about Western redbud. And from what I can tell, Western redbud is a separate species. Eastern redbud is Cercis canadensis. Western redbud is Cercis occidentalis. And unfortunately, it's not a plant that's available for monitoring in Nature's Notebook right now. And so unfortunately, if folks on the webinar only have Western redbud in their yard, um, that's not a plant that we're at this point taking observations on. Is that correct? Yeah, so if there are a lot of people interested mm -hmm. in Western redbud, we can add it. It probably wouldn't be until next year. So feel free to reach out to me if you want that species added and we'll put in a request. Um, and in the meantime, you can always print out paper data sheets and then it'll be the same protocol basically for Western redbud. So you can keep your data on the paper data sheets this year. Um, and then we'd be able to have you upload them for the Western redbud once it's in the system next year. And then um, we also, let's see, there were several questions about recording specific details around either about either the site or the plant. And so I tried to answer those in the chat. Um, when you are registering your site, you have the option to indicate 
a number of different forms of metadata, things like the how, how urban the site is versus rural, um, how, um, uh, let's see, I think it, we ask, what's, what else do we ask about site? Things like uh, slope and aspect. Uh -huh. And distance and then, to water bodies. Yeah, the degree of urbanization. Um, if you are if you have animal species on your list, we ask whether there are feeders um, at your site, things that would attract animals there um, kind of artificially. Yeah, and all that is, you know, it, it's on that page when you're creating your account where it asks you to set up a site, you can answer those there. Or you can always go back if you have a site already um, and go into the add or edit site, um, and then you can add in those details later. And then similarly, there's you, you're able to indicate information about the specific plant as well. Um, some folks were asking about whether uh, it matters if the tree was planted or growing there wild or um, the shade status or the, the exposure, northern or southern, southern exposure. All those things can be indicated um, when you register the, the tree as well. And yes. definitely are um, not picky about whether the tree is planted versus occurring wild. Well, it looks and like it so, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, someone commented about how Jorge um, helped them save our huge redbud branch that split during a major storm <laughs> in Northern Virginia uh, from Suzanne. So she said, thank you. You're welcome, Suzanne. I can find out more uh, professional advice if you wish to have that. I just wanted to say to you, Erin, there's been a bit of chatter on here about different um, either setting up new groups or inviting folks to existing local phonology networks. Um, and I wanted to just uh, emphasize that if you are someone who's thinking about encouraging um, your friends to participate or setting up a group at a new site, please reach out to us because we can help with the mechanics on that. And of course, offer fantastic support as Erin has demonstrated very well <laughs> through this webinar. Yeah, and feel free to reach out if you think of other questions later, or you know, as you start getting uh, started with your observations, there are always questions that come up at that point. So um, feel free to reach out. Um, also, we can address questions that we're getting a lot in our campaign emails and provide um, you know photographs and things to help with tricky things that are are coming up as part of the campaign. So make sure you sign up for the the campaign emails. And we will be recording, posting the recording of this uh, webinar up on that landing page um, for the project, which I will stick in the chat again. And we are here to answer your questions too. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Yes, and we can post the slides as well on the landing page as a PDF. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank yes, you, thank you, everybody. Thank you.